last talk was a thin slice compared to what we've got here today, so this is fantastic. The talk today is about chronometry. Chronometry is a difficult subject. It's highly technical. I did a podcast four years ago. It was an hour long with a whole lot of editing in, in between. So we probably talked for like two and a half hours to get uh, a one hour podcast. It is mysterious because no one shares information about watches that fail test. So I think, I think that's rather indicative of the watch industry anyway. Um, people don't like to talk about their, their failures, they like to talk about their wins. And this all plays into a sense of um, hubris, probably, within the watch industry. Anyone that's had a Rolex, anyone that's had an Omega, um, just as two examples, will know, will know what I mean by that, because one is always trying to outdo the other. And now we bring another big brand into it, which is Tudor. And Tudor has gone down the Omega route for testing. It's a mystery in that they're not sharing. They're not sharing a lot. Then you've got other companies that, that don't follow the two or three big brands. They're doing their own thing. The tests are quite different. So, I wanted to start this off so that it's simple. Try to keep it as simple as possible so you can get an understanding of, of what's going on. There's going to be some talk a little bit later about magnetism. Magnetism is uh, an arch foe of watchmaking. The number of times I see people come in to say, my, my watch isn't working properly, and it's purely magnetism. So, we're going to start off with this. It's the science of accurate time measure. All this is, is very odd anyway, because it's all very subjective. We have a standard as to what we think time is. But if you think about what space time is, it's something very different, sidereal time. Now, our watch is not calibrated to sidereal time, so we choose 24 hours in a day, not 24 hours, 10 minutes and 36 seconds, right? So we simplify it already. When it comes down to chronometry, the testing is kept in line by very, very accurate clocks. We will get into that a little bit later. degree to which the result of the measurement conforms to a standard. Yeah, there we go. So the big word there is conforming. What's conforming? Do we conform a lot? Do we conform a little? Where, where actually is it in, in that spectrum of conforming, right? And this is the next bit. With rules or standards. So the standards are set by people. Sometimes it's, it's companies like Metas, and this is just, this is one document on their testing. And here's another document that, that is all about the standards that, which have to be achieved. And they're, they're, they're similar but different, right? And to Bramont, who is, a chronometer manufacturer, which is yeah, it's different to one too. Ultimately, it's a talk about standards. Why do we need it? Right? Why why do we need chronometers and, and standards in today's world where you can wear an Apple Watch and you know exactly what time it is to the second? And, and that, you could say, is very reliable, right? I think this all goes down to engineering and hubris and this competition between companies. So what started it all off? 
way back in the 1500s, 1600s, the world needed navigation for ships, for trading. Well, many ships were lost at sea because they couldn't navigate accurately. Or they ended up on rocks and were destroyed and things like that because they couldn't navigate accurately. So this is where a book that Dava Sobel wrote called Longitude it is a suit of accurate timekeeping so that the British, the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, who are traveling massive distances could actually get there accurately and safely. So accurate timekeeping came from that. But in those days, I mean, there was no electronics. Right? It was only mechanical. So it required an engineering effort that was second to none. Now, I don't want to uh, put a spoiler on this and, and tell you all about that part of it, because that could be just another talk. But if you happen to find a copy of Dava Sobel's uh, Longitude, I believe there was a short movie too made on that. And you'll find out that one very humble British watchmaker made a clock and made numerous clocks and made numerous tests to be able to say, yes, we, we can now discover longitude as opposed to latitude, which they already know. So we started off talking about standards. Well, these are the primary standards, ISO. ISO is used, for those people that are engineers in the room, ISO is used for global standards on pretty much anything you can think of. Food delivery, building design, pipe design. So anyone that wants to be able to certify something will go to ISO and ISO will probably have a solution for them to be able to certify. Oh, I should say. International Standards Organization, this is DN, Deutsche Industrie Norm. It's a, a, an agency purely German. But there is a standard for watches, for DIN, for chronometry with DIN. It's something that started up more recently. Uh, again, it was closed down for a long time. The French have something to but, but these are the, the, the main ones. And everyone's heard of COSC. These are all very basic standards. They're not talking about, well, what happens if, to the timekeeping if we vibration test this? What happens to the timekeeping if we slam that watch with all kinds of magnetism? Is it going to still work? Nothing to do with that at all. It's just purely timekeeping. Very, very basic. So, the ISO standard is 3159. That's right here. So this is this is pretty cool. For those of you that like math, you'll you'll get a massive kick out of this. If you can see it. It's like equation sit for for, for mere watchmakers. Me, it's a night. Especially being dyslexic. But engineers take care of that. And cost. Well, go onto the cost website, you won't, you won't get, you won't get too much. You get um, a, a document that basically says, okay, the watch is gonna come in like this, then we're gonna test them away. And these are the tests we're gonna do. But they don't really get a lot into the nitty gritty. An international standard lays down the definition of the term chronometer. So in the picture on the side, you can actually see um, sort of the tests that they do under, under the criteria. The units that they're using to measure with in seconds per day, 
and the category minimum requirements. So categories one and two often are of a slightly different size movement. So if a watch goes through testing with ISO, it has to meet these, otherwise it's thrown out. ISO testing is both for both cased and uncased movements. And this is a global standard. So anyone can actually take a batch of watches to them and say, hey, we'll, we, we'd like you to test this so they can have a chronometer certificate. So once it has a chronometer certificate, what that means is they can charge more for watch. And there's a bit more prestige. A lot of engineering goes into being able to pass these tests. Metallurgy being the biggest focus on it, especially when you get into the, the, uh, the plus tests, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. But for that, cased and uncased watches. There's a big difference actually. I'll let you into this. When when we do our testing here for timekeeping when we service the watch, our first test is on the uncased movement. When we've got that and we've dialed it in, we then case it. When you put the movement under the stress of a case, when you're tightening up the case back, especially when it comes down to threaded case backs, that timekeeping can change. Right? So this is where having a watch that has gone through a, um, a battery of tests cased up is a better watch. Right? It's not just here, we're going to do all these movements, racks and racks and racks of movements, send them out to the company that's going to be doing the assembly. The moment you do that, what happens to the, the, the watch movement? It goes into a different environment. You've got hands on the watch sometimes. There's particulate in the watch. Once the test is done, it's a snapshot in time. And I want you to keep that in mind here because that's all it is, is a snapshot in time. So what they're gonna do is they're going to test for a number of different things. The first thing is mean daily rate. So it's basically the first 10 days of tests, they measure the timekeeping each day. So they wind the watch each day, so it's fully wound when it goes into the test. And for 10 days, they look at it the next morning and say, oh, snapshot. Well, what's this? What was it to the day before? Right? Then they take the next, the next day. Day two. What was it to the, to day one? Day three. What was it to day two? And then they they take that, divide it by the period of ten days, and then you get your your mean rate. And if that falls into the category of a pass for them, it's like boom. Okay, those can go. I will add that these movements have to be identified. They have to be identified. <clears throat> so any watch that goes in for testing has to have a serial number on it. And that's another big tell when you're looking at a watch. Aside from the caliber number, if it has a very, very prominent serial number, you know that it's actually gone through standards testing because they keep that number and that stays all the way through the testing so they can they come forward. Because when you've got thousands of movements that are the same movements, how else do you differentiate? The mean variation of rates, five absolute values of variations of rates obtained for the five positions of the watch during the first 10 days. I didn't mention right at the beginning that they take the watch movement and they put it into five different positions for the 10 days. So they're taking that into consideration. Why? Positional error is a killer. What's positional error? 
positional error is the, the effect of gravity on the oscillating system. What's the oscillating system? The oscillating system is that part that you see in an open, open back watch that is swinging back and forth. It's called balance. The balance is a big wheel and it's going back and forth in different positions like this, right? If there's a heavy spot on the balance, it's going to favor gravity. That will have an effect on its timekeeping. So that tells you that, oh my goodness, now this is an additional complication to this test because now we're putting in positions. For those of you that have been interested in watches for, for some time, you, you will have seen certain movements saying tested to six positions, tested to five positions, tested to three positions, right? All that means is that that watch has been put into different positions and the timekeeping registered and then looked upon the day before for, for the deviation for that period of time and before any of these standards were there because they, they first came out in 72 or 74 they were just like okay so this is good enough we, it, it fits we, yeah we can move along we can move along with that but then it's like well but what to what standard this is where the standards come yeah. so in 1972 this is when uh, ISO appeared and said, okay, so if, we, if we're playing the numbers game, we need to actually put it down in writing that this is what we're doing. If you look at the blue part, right, the, the very last sentence there, a line, it says the time is observed to within limits of 0.5 seconds. So for ISO, what they do is they demand that the movements come in. They've got hands on them. Typically, it will have a, a white dial with black hands. The reason for that is that they take a photograph in the machine that's actually doing the test, right? Has to be high contrast for the camera to get it. Then it's compared against the, the day before. So a lot of that is actually quite automated, which is really cool. Anyone that saw Udinki's video on assembly in Tudor will see that there's robots now running around. A lot of this stuff is robotic and it's hands off for the most part. Even when it comes down to loading trays and cartridges of watches into the testing machines, right? It's like a big robotic arm comes along, puts it in place, clamps it, then putting it into different positions, etc., etc. Even the winding is automated. It's pretty cool, actually. So, just going back to it, the mean daily rate, the mean variation of rates over the 10 days, and then the greatest variation. The absolute value of the greatest five variation in rates with regard to the five positions that watched during the first 10 days of the test. And it has to be measured and accurate to within 0.5 seconds. So in the way of cost, it has to be a maximum variation, no more than five seconds per day. So it can be less than that. That's it. Doesn't beat that. It's got. When you think about that, when a, when a movement doesn't pass that test, the company that sends the movement in doesn't, doesn't have a squad of guys going around finding a watch made with a symbol in it. Like, it's time on that one. What the heck were you doing? Were you out with your friends last night when you assembled that watch? What's going on? It's not like that at all because a lot of these movements are assembled by machine. Then you have temperature. Variation of rates based on temperature. So they take the watch between 8 degrees Celsius 
and 30 degrees in the ISO test. But just, just remember, we're talking about ISO. Temperature is a big factor. Anyone that knows anything about metal knows that as you heat up metal, it expands. When you chill it, it contracts. Expansion and contraction, when it comes down to time accuracy, is critical. Before there were these fancy materials used in the balance today, where that have very little, um, where temperature has very little effect on their expansion and contraction. In the early days of matchmaking, they used brass, right? Or steel. The brass is a very soft metal. It's going to expand and contract quite easily with, with the slightest amount in change in temperature. So then, watchmakers came up with the fantastic idea. You know what we're going to do? We're going to devise a way to take brass and steel. We're going to laminate it together. Bimetallic balances. In old pocket watches, you'll see that. It's really cool, right? You'll see brass on the outside, steel on the inside, steel on the outside, brass on the inside. But it's laminated together. So that way, one fights against the other or slows the other one down. Why does it matter about expansion and contraction? When a balance expands, it's getting bigger. It's getting bigger and it will slow everything down. When the balance contracts, it's getting small and it will speed up. So even when it comes down to pendulums, it's not just steel, it's in bubble. So this is a particular material that, that actually tries to compensate for change in temperature. So this particular test that's done is very important because, hey, how many people travel? How many people like going up to the mountains and then a few months later there will be summer tropical, right? That watch is going through all of that. Plus also, it's taken, it's taking the temperature of your wrist. When you take your watch off at night and you put it on the bedside table, it's cooling down. But people don't worry about timekeeping. That's a big deal because, hey, if it, if it changes time when it's not on your wrist, you're more likely to wear it. But you don't know that. You think it's something wrong with the watch. But modern watches have materials in them that don't expand and contract so greatly that they're going to affect the timekeeping. However, this test is a test that is to ensure that that movement that's going into that watch, that's going to have a chronometer label on it, is certainly within very, very strict standards. Because nobody, nobody will notice five seconds a day on their watch unless, unless they're actually, you know, testing. But they'll notice it in seven days because of the cumulative effect, right? Most people don't set their watches every single day, right? Some people do, but most people don't. So this is actually a very, very important test. And then the last test they do is the resumption of rate. It's obtained by subtracting the average of the first two days rates from the last day's rates. So it's gone through all these tests, right? They take the first two days, look at the last day, and that's it. That has to be within plus to minus five seconds a day. And that's tough. That's a tough test. Five seconds a day is nothing. 
when you look at average watches, a very nice average watch is not. Is it going to be plus or minus five seconds a day? Chances are not, right? Because it's not a chronometer. It hasn't been made to be there. Is it a good timekeeper? Yes, you bet. Now, the other thing I want to say, just going back to this slide because I skipped over it, is that the ISO 3159 standard only applies to mechanical watches. And you're like, what? Hey, you mean there's a standard for quartz watches? You betcha. There's a thing called thermocompensated quartz. Yeah, different set of tests that include vibrations. None of these tests for mechanical watches include vibrations, but for quartz it has to be. Now the big boy, cost. I hate to break it to you, but cost, unfortunately, if you're a Canadian watchmaker, will not work for you, per se, because it's only for the Swiss. Now, this is an interesting thing because when Bramont first started producing their watches, they were cost tested because the movements were Swiss. Now that they're producing their own movements, they certainly can't use cost. So that means that they have no choice but to use the ISO standard 3159 which is cool, but COSC does a few extra tests. So it does the standard tests. Cased and uncased movements, which is great. COSC actually also does certify some clocks, but a very different battery of tests because you can't be putting pendulum clocks into machines that are spinning and putting different positions. So not only do the movements have to be Swiss, but they must have been assembled in Switzerland. When it comes down to the Swatch Group, if they're getting their factories in Thailand to assemble the movements that are then sent back to Switzerland, there is absolutely no way COSC is going to accept those movements. And it's actually quite uh, a high number. Uh, of 60% of that movement needs to be manufactured in Switzerland. So not only assembled, but manufactured in Switzerland. And this is purely because then they can actually also give it the Swiss-made moniker on the movement and on the dial. So anything that has that moniker, 60% plus has been made. So during the first 10 days, the movements are tested in five positions, each for 48 hours. So now cost is telling you that this is what they're doing. The crown is this thing. So even on an uncased watch, the movement that comes in a movement holder, a special movement holder, will have the crown and it will be a black plastic one at the end of the stem. Black plastic because contrast is needed for the machinery to be able to see. So, crown left is that one. Dial up, or for most testing, when you when you look at this, it will say CH for dial up. Catlin O. The Catlin is the dial. Catlin bar, CB is dialed down. All very common wearing positions. But that having been said, I mean, we're not walking around the whole day with the watch like this. Right? No movement. So it is a static test. Each day, the watch is wound and there is a constant temperature. The temperature variations happen at a later date, but 23 degrees is the key number there. During the first 10 days, the movements are tested in those five positions. Temperature of 23 degrees, 
if the movement is a chronograph, and this is the point I wanted to make with this slide, it's activated on the last day only. Now, a chronograph is different from a chronometer. Chronometer has to be tested through a standard. It's a three-hand watch, but not a stopwatch. Right? A chronograph is like the Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch, where it has multiple buttons, the crown, start, stop, return to zero, so you can actually measure time. So for that, this is an important test because when a chronograph is activated, there's more gearing that comes into play to be able to show you the elapsed time from the time you started. That will inevitably result in a drop in amplitude of the balance. So remember that wheel that I said, spin. It's going to have an amplitude, typically of around 190 to, to 310 degrees. Can't do 360 because there's gear on the balance that will stop it from doing that. You, you don't want that watch swinging that much, it will damage it. So 290, let's just say 290 degrees. And that's in standard operation. When it's dial up, it's going to be a little bit more because one of the pivots, it's only resting on one pivot at the bottom. When you turn it dial up, it's resting on the top pivot. When you turn it onto its side, two pivots are resting in jewels, which create a little bit of extra drag. So you can expect at least a 30 degree drop in amplitude at, in that position to this position. But again, we're not walking around with our watches like this, all day, right? So a little bit here, a little bit there. This is what we test. We test on this. So the watches are being rotated constantly into different positions. We're, we're not a standard, but we have our own personal standard for how we we time watches. Static testing, dynamic testing, and then run down test. Get to that again. So in the COSC test, we've done those 10 days. On days 11 through 13, this is where we get into the temperature range. Eight degrees to, tw uh, to uh, 23 degrees, and it has to still keep within that range. Now, is that difficult? I'm sure it was the very first time they tried it because they were still trying to figure out their metallurgy for the parts because it isn't just the balance, it's the wheels, the mainspring, the barrel. How is this incredible assembly of parts working together in these extreme temperatures, right, to be able to keep and be extremely accurate, it's, it's a miracle. But it's all down to the metallurgy, using those materials that don't expand and contract a lot. So when they figured out what those materials were and they started to actually produce watches using those materials, hey, Life was good. They could almost guarantee the fact that, hey, it, it, this is going to be, uh, this is going to pass these, these types of tests. But it's stringent. Last two days, the temperature is brought back down to 23 degrees and the movement is returned to its original position with the crowd facing left. Although the cost procedure is standardized and machine operated to allow for testing of large batches, cost also provides alternative testing methods. So ISO is only, as I said before, mechanical. COSC has its own testing for quarks and dust clocks. 
They will adapt their tests for a fee to those companies that want to tighten up the tolerances, but the standard tolerances we've just talked about. So when it comes down to quartz, it tests them in one position, dial up for 11 days. Why only one position? Any thoughts? Mechanical watches, five positions. Quartz watches, just one. Is it just because they're like, oh, it's quartz? Fewer moving parts? Uh, yes, that's exactly it. It's fewer moving parts. Parts that are not greatly affected by the Earth's core. Quartz watches are great because they're basically a tuning fork piece of quartz that's oscillating at a very high rate because it's oscillating at a far higher rate than mechanical watches and it doesn't have any parts that are affected by, truly affected by gravity. They are going to be more accurate. But cost went, ha! We're going to test them really hard because we're going to make sure that they withstand shocks of 100 Gs and 200 of them during their testing period. But no shocks were ever introduced into any of the other standards for mechanical watches. The question is, one company has done shock testing on their watches and that's Vermont because of this when they were doing the standards. The Martin Maker, it's supposed to withstand ejecting at 20 something Gs, I think it is, from a cockpit, rockets blazing to get you away, the pilot away from the plane as fast as it possibly can at the very last moment before it crashes. So when Bramont did their test. They, Martin Baker, the, the British company that makes 75% of these ejection seats, strapped a watch onto the mannequin and they did their testing there. The very first test, what they found was that the watch just plainly stopped. It was broken by the time the mannequin hit the ground and that was that. Vibrations are horrible for mechanical watches. So the engineers at Ramon went back and, and said, okay, well, okay, we've got a chronometer and we've got one that is supposed to work after um, an injection. What do we do? They focused on finding out what the cause of the stoppage was. Why did it stop? This, for, for those of you that have heard this term, 5Y analysis is starting off at the very top and asking why did this happen? Then getting to the, the answer to that and asking why did that happen? We're going now five times. Typically at that point after five times or sooner, you will get to the, the root cause of the problem. And the problem was the vibration. Watches, modern watches have anti-shock. We're all walking around, we're banging things. You've heard me bang my watch a couple of times already this morning and I haven't paid any attention to it because it's not the case. But it stops watches. There is a shock absorbing system on the balance, the balance wheel that wheel that's going around like this, that's held in place by two jewels. They are not static jewels, they're actually movable, right? So if a watch gets a, a knock like this, Right? The jewel is moving to compensate for it. But the thing is, what they found was that when you had crazy vibrations, the watch would stop. So it's like, okay, it's down to dampening now. Dampening the vibration from those two massive rockets, or more in certain scenes, that as they're going out, it's, it's a very per percussive, apparently a very percussive event, right? So they put, they tested out different rubbers and they put, mounted the movement in what I call a Goldilocks rubber that's not too hard, not too soft, 
right? And it worked. It dampened the vibrations. Shocks are terrible. Magnetism is terrible. DIM 8319. If you ask me in 10 minutes, what are these numbers? I won't remember them. Just saying. I'm dyslexic and I never remember them. So. DIM 8319 is a very, very, very similar standard um, to ISO. Just that DIN has introduced a couple of interesting things. So, Hey, like cost, they went, huh? There's Germans. We will have our own standard. So it has to be manufactured in Glashütte, which is the German manufacturing center for horology. Only fully cased movements. Again, remember early on I said, the moment you put a movement into a watch and tighten up that case back, things can change. They do that for that reason. And it's not taking the watches from testing, transporting them to a different environment to then put into a, 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 a case and then send it out. Because then the certification would not be valid. We're gonna get into this in, in just a moment, but when it comes down to Omega and Master Chronometer, they have Metas. They worked with Metas to create this testing regime in the assembly factory. So it's not the movements when they're, when they're first tested, and we'll get into this in a minute, they're not leaving the building before being integrated into a case to continue their testing off. So just wait for that for a second. The other interesting thing about this is that for DIN, DIN A319, all watches have to have stop seconds. For those of you that, that have followed a little bit our Instagram, I had uh, taken some macro shots of uh, balance stop springs. Most people like to call it hacking seconds, where you pull the crown out and it stops. The seconds hand, or the movement, ultimately. But they insist on having that. Why, I'm not too sure. I've never got an answer for that, but they're just like, yes, this is what we're doing. 55% has to be made in Germany. A little bit less than the Swiss, but, you know, for a neo-nascent industry that Germany now has, it's understandable. I don't think that Nomos, for example, makes 100% of their, of their parts in Germany, in their watches. But they make a rule for what inspired them 55%. So, plus certifications. This is a very interesting thing. I was sitting there putting putting together these, these slides and I'm like, yeah, okay, so what kind of pithy, witty thing can I say? The thing about the plus certifications is that they really are companies that are trying to push the limits of their production and design. Not design for how the watch looks, but design of the movement. To say, yes, you know what, we have so designed, we, we've designed this movement so well that it's gonna, it's gonna pass these even more stringent tests. A few companies actually have them. For the most part, everyone knew Rolex's superlative chronometer. They were really one of the first companies to actually come out with, a, with plus testing, right? It was to say, okay, well, all of our watches meet or beat cost standards. 
But we're kind of more than just what Kosk standard is. We're, we're, we're a, an engineering company. We're a prestigious engineering company. What else can we do? So there are plus certifications and there are shields. So if you look at that, this, this bottom picture there, with the PP inside the shield, that is Patek's promise to something a little bit more than cost. The plus certifications are seals are to draw attention. It's like, hey, we're not just a standard watch company because we can build something bigger and better, you don't want to say fast for this. I'm sure it all started off with being marketing, right? Marketing department comes down and says, yes, we've got to, you know, we've been told we've got to, we've got to be part of the uh, uh, expansion of this company. So what can we do to get people to buy more watches? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's a little bit of hubris. Maybe it is. Maybe it's one company starting something, doing something like that, the other company in their boardroom, they're stretching their heads going, well, what are we going to do to, to beat that? People will be buying their watches and all that. Right? So all of this rolls up into that. But one thing is for sure, and this is that last line in there, that they take immense pride in outperforming and overachieving. So the two big plus standards are Metas and Rolex. Metas, uh, like I said earlier, um, they're a metallurg Swiss's metallurgy testing facility. And Omega went to them and said, hey, we want to do extra tests. Would you be interested in partnering with us uh, to be able to get those tests completed? So Omega outlined the tests that they wanted to do. Metas then sat down in their boardroom and said, okay, well, how are we gonna do this? All new machinery, who's paying for this? Omega said, ooh, ooh, we'll do it. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. The amount of money that goes into the machinery that tests this stuff. Their magnetism test that we'll get to in a minute has a machine which weighs three tons. It was built in Yverdon, Switzerland. It can't rest on the floor. This is a 15,000 Gauss machine. Remember 15,000 Gauss. Because we're gonna get into it. So what really is this Metas test? Well, Omega thought, hey, Rolex has the mill gas. It's been around for ages. For those of you that don't know what the mill gas is, it is a highly magnetic field resistant watch. It was made for purely just for engineers at the CERN particle accelerator, where there are massive magnetic fields. The kind of magnetic fields that will just kill quartz watches. So magnetic exposure testing, water resistance testing, none of the other standards had anything to do with water. But there are a lot of commercial divers out there that, that are needing dive watches. So how do they know when they're buying a watch for diving that it's actually going to be, have been tested to a certain standard so they can be assured that it's going to remain water resistant at the depths that they were going into. The saturation divers too. Power reserve test. None of the other tests got to power reserve. Is this mechanical movement going to form to the manufacturer's specification that this watch will run for 42 hours at a minute, at the end of all these tests. So they toss that in there as well. There's the standard accuracy testing. This is, this, this, this part here is a whole other tool that we're gonna do. Isochronism, I love it. I love this 
this particular topic. They actually include an isochronism test. We'll, we'll get into what it exactly is, but basically, when you wind your watch fully, the spring is tight, there's so much power going through the gear train, it's going to be giving impulse to the balance that can swing like crazy to give you your 290 to 310 degrees. But wait, what if you've left your watch on the bedside table and you're like, I'm not wearing you to get pick up your other watch and you walk away from this. Then you come back two days later after wearing the other one and they're like, oh, I missed you. Bring you back on this. It hasn't moved. If it's an automatic watch, it hasn't moved. Right? So it's just been winding down. Is the timekeeping going to be as accurate at that low wind state as it was at the high wind state. Ultimately, that's isochronous in a nutshell. Then there's rate deviation test, similar to the isochronous test. Okay, so movements. Certified movements are returned to Geneva to be integrated into cases. So they go through a cost test first. So this is double test, right? So this is why it's plus. The precision test of each watch over a 24 hour cycle in seven static positions, as well as a rotating rack in accordance with exclusive mythology methodology that simulates real life rack, which is fitness, right? Each watch is tested first time subjected to high internal pressure for the waterproofness and then immersing it in water in a hyperbaric tank, really making sure that that is water resistant. And the way that they know that, when they get to that test, it's, a, it's an old watchmaker's trick. They take the watch out of, out of the water and they drop a single drop of cold water on the crystal. If the watch fogs up inside, they know, ha, it leaked. Simple, simple test, right? And self-winding. So when you think about this, this is a Grimaud watch. We want to put this in here because you can see how many components are interacting with each other for temperature testing. So with all this expansion and contraction of materials, right? It's not that something like this can, can, can even keep time, let alone keep time to a chronometer standard. And I think that's something that everyone needs to remember here. It's architecture. It's metallurgy. It's art. And I only use Grimaud uh, because they, they just made a, a fantastic video of this. The tests that they actually do in METAS, when it comes down to magnetism, are intense. Because what they actually do is, they put the watches into um, uh, this incredible electromagnet that has 300 magnets in it. it is a magnetic field of 15,000 Gauss. 15,000 Gauss is crazy. You can buy um, rare earth magnets, big ones, that'll be about 4,000 Gauss, or probably about this big. If you put it on a steel door, it will take approximately 100 pounds 
pressure to pull it off. Probably more if, if you're trying to pull it for the full surface area, but just to be able to break it free a little bit and pull it off, it's a minimum of, of 100 pounds. So I'll let you guys do the math on how strong that feel is. So they take the watch, they put it into the machine, sap it with 15,000 gauss, and then demagnetize it. And they do that four times, and then check the rate. Is it, is it still keeping a rate? Now, some may say, ah, it's kind of, it's kind of a redundant test given the fact that so many companies are now using non-ferrous materials, right? Kudinki actually wrote a fascinating article about a magnet like that. And they took a mill gauss and they took um, uh, an Omega master chronometer. And basically, they subjected the watch to that field. So they put the, the watch on top of it. So it's not to damage the watch in any way. They, they put a little, uh, uh, some gauze over the top. What they found was, was that the materials, even in the case that both companies were using, were non-ferrous enough that they could just like, literally just with little effort, when you think about Rolex's Parachrom hairspray, when you talk about um, silicon hairsprays, there's no ferrous material in them. So it's going to. But this is the future of watchmaking, I think, and it's all down to materials. And the amount of money that that a company wants to go into spending to be able to produce something that is going to do that. Like I said, they put a lot of money into magnetism and uh, making sure watches do not get magnetized. Some watches like this, they have a Faraday cage. It, I don't like the term Faraday cage. Um, Faraday cage just reminds me of a top secret bunker where you've got tin foil and a and a mesh cage all around you so communications can't get in and out. It's an MU shield. So soft iron claw, sort of dial, the back of the dial is soft iron, the, the, uh, there's a second internal case which is soft iron that uh, touches the dial as well to make absolute contact. And then it, can with, then it can withstand very, very high uh, magnetic fields. But, hey, when you've got a watchmaker next to you and you get your watch magnetized, you can just bring it there. It's this machine that demagnetizes. Very simple, 10 seconds. Done. But if you don't get magnetism in, it, in the first place, you're going to pay a lot of money for that. So, does it all make sense? Is it worth the money? <laughs> is it marketing? Is it prowess? Definitely. Especially with the Swiss, they're very proud of everything they do. And do we actually need mechanical watches to be that accurate these days? How many people are actually using their watch for navigation? The big thing here is, is just the achievement. The achievement that these companies have, have, have made in being able to think about use cases that are extreme and then be able to build a watch that can stand all of these tests that they're put through. But the moment you open up your box with your new watch that's a master chronometer, you like, wow, that's beautiful. And you put it on your wrist walk out the door, that is the end of the snapshot. That's it. It's not going to be a chronometer in a month's time.
Hello everyone, this is Jason and I want to thank you for being with us today listening to the Roldorf Cafe podcast. You can hear more of our shows and when they're released on Instagram and our website. We cover many topics about watches, the industry and the brands we're most passionate about. You can find the Roldorf shop at 307 West Cordova in Gastown in Vancouver. And we'd be delighted to welcome you and talk watches. Visit our website for more information at roldorf.co.